Okay, folks, I hope you can hear me. Um, we'll see. Did everybody enjoy Rob? Wasn't any good? Very good. Uh, I have a talk that I'm supposed to give at Tyndale Seminary on Monday, and you guys were my test case, but I spoke at Northeastern Seminary as well, which uh, Brent is has knows a little bit about. It's our Wesleyan Seminary, right? And so thank you for coming. I, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit off the cuff, which I don't like to do. It's not very academic, but I think it's what the Holy Spirit wants. So let's, uh, let's pray, if we could. Oh, Lord, uh, um, it's an honor to be uh, with the body of Christ and to be with others who have come here to listen, to learn. And uh, it's my prayer that uh, we would just quiet ourselves and allow your spirit to speak to us, uh, even now. I pray somehow that the church would be the church, that we would be embracing, we would be loving. But the church has to speak the truth. The church is called to represent Jesus Christ as the Messiah of God. And I pray somehow that in this talk and what I'm going to share, we will begin to understand exactly what that means and why we do not follow Muhammad and his interpretations of things. I pray most of all that if there are any Muslims that come here, and we may have some later, that somehow the Holy Spirit would touch them. I also pray that in my talk, that the body of Christ would be equipped, that they would begin to get some understanding of the way that they think. And when we say they, we are not necessarily talking about our neighbor, and we're not necessarily talking about ISIS. We're talking about a billion and a half very complex beliefs under the umbrella of Islam. And I pray that somehow we would begin uh, to just be sensitive to you because if the church cannot do it nobody can so help us God in in Jesus name Amen okay um, someone had asked me to talk about who I am because they don't know who I am uh, so uh, first of all let me just say to the church thank you so much I feel like since I've been in this church I've been very very selfish I've given very little time to the church uh, like I'd like to and I'm going to graduate uh, God willing in a couple of weeks and I'll have more time to to serve uh, the body of Christ um, so thank you thank you for coming thank you for supporting and it's my sincere prayer that we would grow in love that we would grow in fellowship with one another <clears throat> Maybe you feel something a little different here in the way that we're doing things, the way we connect, the way we introduce people. And maybe we need to do this kind of thing a little bit more um, and stay out of our individual worlds. Part of that, the reason I bring that up is because that's a huge problem with Muslims. So I have a couple of ex-Muslims who have now become Christians, but I can't get them to come to church. And uh, the last time I was with a Palestinian... Majid, who has come to Christ very genuinely, um, and uh, and he just broke down in tears. I mean, really broke down because he didn't know where he belonged. He was trying to serve Christ from a militant Islamic family here in Ottawa. Right now, where is he? He's in northern Iraq, uh, working with the Kurds, and I think he's five kilometers from ISIS or something. So that's where he's at. But uh, I, uh, part of what I want the church to hear is that if we would be the church, um, if, has any of you, have any of you seen any of my writings on Facebook? Anybody? Probably some of you. Has anybody been disturbed by my writings on Facebook? <clears throat> I'm disturbed by my writings on Facebook. Um... When you see those writings, you're seeing me uh, reaching out to Syrians. 
And I'm not even thinking about the church. So I'll say things about the church and people will get offended because they don't realize that I'm talking about the global church. I'm talking about the church that Muslims see. And that church is not necessarily like this church. That church might be something completely different. And that's, <clears throat> that's what happens. But we'll get to that. About me. Born in Washington, D.C. Uh, did not in any way uh, even think about Jesus. Didn't know who he was. Could care less. I was a pro tennis player to be. Um, last tournament I played in was in Germany. Doesn't look like it now because I have quite a bit of weight on me. Uh, and I put a lot of weight on with seminary. So hopefully you guys need to pray that I, I lose it. But um, after this is all over, it's a bad witness in many ways. But um, I, uh, I failed as a professional. I was a, a sort of junior pro and uh, went, to, went to a lot of interesting things, but I just wasn't good enough to be a real pro. So uh, ended up in the military, U.S. Air Force, ended up getting really good assignments. Very dedicated soldier. So I ended up on NATO bases with nuclear weapons. Uh, wasn't supposed to talk about it at that time. And lived in Holland where I got very interested in the underground church. Um, and God opened the doors. <clears throat> By that time I had become a Christian. I'd also run a restaurant in Las Vegas, Nevada, right on the Strip. Uh, with two other guys, I was a young, zealous believer. God really uh, revealed himself to me when I was a skeptic, So, and I still am sometimes. <laughs> uh, so a lot of times my approach to Muslims is I, I, I will tell them things like, I don't like religious hocus pocus, let's get to the issues here. I don't like it with Christians and I don't like it with Muslims. And that sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? But boy, it works. <clears throat> it works when you're straight with them. Um, long story short was that uh, I ended up working in the underground church for a while. Saw some pretty interesting things. Got set up and almost, please don't translate this. Maybe, Elena, you might not want to translate this. But uh, I was uh, pretty much almost set up by the KGB and arrested. And uh, they threatened me, I think, 20 times the night I left. Told me they were going to kill me. And uh, I had done an interview with the underground church the night before, which was pretty powerful. And uh, so I know a little bit about Russia, and I know a, a, a fair amount about what the other perspectives are against the U.S., against the West. Um, a lot of that came out of what I would call Soviet propaganda that also lined up in the Middle East as well. <clears throat> But I, I don't want to get into the politics of that. But the bottom line is that um, a lot of the world doesn't um, understand our, our way of looking at things. So I came back home to the U.S. My, again, my family are not believers. Uh, I could tell you a whole story about that. But <clears throat> And uh, I started a forum to help people uh, who – I had met so many wonderful people uh, abroad – that uh, I, I, I started a forum basically to, to reach out to immigrants. Did this a number of years ago. And it was fairly successful. And uh, for the last 15 years roughly, um, I got so frustrated with the church and their ethnocentric perspectives, I'm being very honest with you in DC, that I literally stepped out of the church and chose to do a forum that was objective. Because, and I started it about six months before 9-11. Then 9-11 happened. And I said, wow, I guess you're in this because I focused on Muslims very, very specifically. I've had uh, Mustafa Malik who interviewed Osama bin Laden. I probably had at least 10 imams speak. Uh, just did an event two months ago on Islam, Islam is violent. Uh, is the Bible violent? Some of you went to that. I think Margaret went to it. So I've done a lot, a lot of events, and I've done a lot of events on the Middle East. When you do a lot of events in the Middle East, around 9-11, thereafter, 
and you get experts that come in like uh, Michael Ishikoff, who wrote the book uh, Selling in the Iraq War. He was one that basically revealed uh, the agenda, uh, the, the economic agenda behind Iraq on some level. Um, you get their perspective on things. And they have a perspective. They have, they see a world that we don't see. If we read papers or we try to listen to their world, uh, then we then we um, we can begin to understand some things. Am I making sense so far? Uh, again, I'm winging this, so I'm going to try to work with the president now. So <clears throat> we have a clash of civilizations, and uh, that's happening because of hyper technology. And as a result, we have Muslims around us now. And what that boils down to is that we've got the old and the new coming together. Uh, I, I also lived in Turkey for a while, and I spent a lot of time. In fact, I took three months of leave in Turkey and just went around. And if you live there, if you live in the Middle East, you would not... One of the hardest things... I remember I was briefed in Frankfurt, Germany, and they said, whatever you do, <clears throat> don't look at the girls. Don't look at the women. So I'm walking around, just like literally with my, my head down all the time, because I was so scared I was going to offend. And I realized that uh, I, I was just blown away at how unbelievably genuine, caring, uh, that's that people were in in was in the Muslim countries of the world. I, I mean, it was at times uh, confounding. And I just wrote on Facebook about my own counter where the last day I was in Turkey. I'm standing there. It starts snowing. I can't remember what city I was in. Maybe Eskishir. And. Uh, and it got really cold suddenly. It started snowing. I was kind of caught off guard with not a whole lot. And this very ragged, uh, older gentleman, probably half street guy, literally came up to me, put his arms around me, gave me his coat, and insisted that I take it. Now, I can't count the amount of times cannot count the amount of times I've had those experiences with Muslims. I cannot count how gracious, whenever we have events, they are the most gracious. They are the, the most caring. Very, very often. So, when we hear about ISIS, when we hear about theology, we're just confounded. Just to give you a, a little the end of the story, I landed <clears throat> back in, in Holland, which was my home, just a few days after that. And I got stuck at this train station and I had to end up walking because somebody who was supposed to pick me up couldn't pick me up. And somebody picked me up. Guy stopped. Turned out to be a Turkish guy. And I started speaking to him in my broken Turkish. And for me, that was a very surreal moment because it was almost as though God was telling me, you know, be careful about making judgments. Be careful about how we look at, at the other. Now I have a question for you guys. Is there any parable from Jesus that talks about this? Anything that would allude to that in the teachings of Jesus? Please go ahead, make it brief. Okay, anybody else? Please. Good Samaritan, Please, Good Samaritan, very good. Okay, so why is the Good Samaritan applicable? Tell us. It's, um, it's simply a story about uh, how 